The Sopranos begins in the summer of 1998 when a New Jersey mafia capo by the name of Tony Soprano is referred to a psychiatrist following a panic attack. His neighbor, physician Dr. Cusimano, can't find anything wrong with Tony physically, so he is advised to talk to Dr. Melfi, the psychiatrist in question. The premise of a mobster talking to a therapist is fascinating. Firstly, because wise guys aren't used to talking about their feelings. It doesn't come naturally to them, and that makes the sessions very enjoyable to watch. And secondly, because it's dangerous. If the word ever gets out that he's talking to a shrink, he might be seen as a liability, even though he chooses his words carefully when talking to Dr. Melfi. He doesn't explicitly discuss his criminal activities, but his fellow mobsters might not see it that way. Tony tells the doctor that he's just a waste management consultant, but she knows that is just a front. They agree that the best way to move forward is for Tony to basically encrypt his sentences when it comes to the mafia, and that way their doctor-patient confidentiality will be kept intact. Tony's main mental issue is a fear of losing his family, actually losing both of his families, the normal one and the mafia one. He's got this feeling that he has come in at the end of something, and that's the cause of his stress. He tells Dr. Melfi the story about a family of ducks showing up at his house and nesting near his pool. Watching them brought him joy as they looked like the happy family he's never had. And when they flew away, he was overwhelmed with feelings of depression because he feared that he would lose his actual family too, as well as losing his grip in his mafia family. Tony's wife is named Carmela, and they've got two kids. AJ and Meadow. Meadow and Carmela aren't on the best of terms as Carmela isn't too fond of her daughter's friend Hunter and this mother-daughter feud isn't doing Tony's mental health any favors. Over the course of the premiere, Tony twice visits a fancy restaurant, first with his mistress and then with his wife and both times the manager acts like he hasn't seen Tony in a while. Tony had promised Carmela that his cheating days were behind him, but he's a lying son of a gun. That's why Carmela thinks Tony will confess to her about his new adventures, but instead he tells her that he is seeing a psychiatrist and she's happy to hear that because she knows his big noggin needs some serious work. He even has the audacity to claim that she's the only person in this world he's completely honest with, but Carmela suspects that's not the case. Another problem for Tony is his ambitious nephew, Chris. He's not Tony's real nephew, he is Carmela's cousin. Chris's father Dicky was like a big brother to Tony, which is why he has a soft spot for Chris, and it's why he calls Chris his nephew. The young lad is not a made man in the mafia yet, he's only an associate and he's constantly looking for ways to get promoted to the rank of a soldier, thus craving for Uncle Tony's approval all the time. Having to keep Chris's hunger in check is one of the reasons for Tony's current mental state. As I said, Chris is always looking for new opportunities to impress his uncle, and one such occurrence takes place in this episode when the Czech mob bids against Tony's company for a waste management contract. Chris invites the Czech family's heir, Emil, to their deli for a bogus drug exchange and whacks the guy. At first, Chris and one of Tony's soldiers, Pussy, try to dump the body in the Czech's dumpster, but Pussy thinks that burying the body elsewhere and sending a silent message to the Czechs with the disappearance of Emil is the way to go. And that plan is a success and the Czechs drop their bid. Later on, Chris is sulky at AJ's birthday party because he feels like he isn't appreciated. He didn't even get a simple thank you from his uncle for getting them the waste management contract. And Tony says fair enough. Tony thanks his nephew because when he was young, he felt the exact same way. Never appreciated or complimented. But Chris pushes his luck a bit too far when he says that he's thinking about writing a script for a movie based on his experiences and even starring in the production. Tony loses it, although he quickly recomposes himself and urges his nephew to enjoy the beautiful day. Talking of uncles and nephews, Tony's uncle Junior is also a capo in the DiMeo crime family, and although he's always been there for Tony, he's getting tired of his nephew's quick rise to the top. And this conflict comes to a head when Junior wants to whack a traitor in a restaurant owned by Tony's friend Artie. Artie and especially his wife Charmaine are already tired of the fact that Junior and company are regulars at the restaurant, so a hit taking place there would be terrible for them and the place's reputation. That's why Tony tries to convince his uncle to do the hit elsewhere. Junior refuses as the trader wouldn't meet him anywhere other than Artie's place, where he would feel safe. 
Tony then takes another approach, giving Ari tickets to a three week long cruise holiday. Ari has no idea why Tony's doing this, but he's happy that he can finally take a break. That is until Charmaine urges him to return the tickets. Still adamant about preventing this hit from damaging Ari's business, Tony has the restaurant blown up by one of his soldiers, his right hand man Silvio. This way, the hit doesn't damage Artie's reputation, and he gets to collect the insurance money to start anew. Junior doesn't appreciate this move. He knows what his nephew has done, and on his way to the aforementioned birthday party, he tells Tony's mother Olivia that something will have to be done about Tony. She looks rather indifferent considering that somebody has just threatened her son's life. That is because Olivia is by far the biggest reason for Tony's mental agony. Even though Tony tries to justify his mother's bitter and resentful and cynical demeanor and abusive actions, because you know, she's his mother, it's clear from the get-go that Livia is nothing like a normal, caring mother. She is widowed and it's obvious that she's too old to live alone anymore, but she refuses to live in the best retirement home in the state. During a visit to that retirement home, Livia's derisive behavior triggers another one of Tony's panic attacks. Dr. Melfi prescribes Prozac for Tony after this collapse. Afterward, he gives credit to the drug for his improved mood, but Dr. Melfi assures him that the sessions are the real reason for that, as the Prozac hasn't been in his system for long enough. Getting back to the business side, this is a good time to mention that Tony has one other prominent soldier in his crew we haven't mentioned, and his name is Polly. So Pussy, Polly and Silvio are his main guys. They are made men and soldiers in the Mafia, while Chris is an associate trying to become a soldier and a made man. Continuing with their business ventures, Chris and Tony chase a gambling addict named Alex who hasn't paid his debt in time, so he gets a good ass beating and his leg is broken. Despite this clear message, Alex can't pay his debt to Tony and Hesh, as he just doesn't have the money. Hesh, by the way, is a friend of Tony's father and a man Tony respects a lot. They do business together, Hesh is in the loan sharking business, as well as other criminal activities. Later on, Tony figures out a way to get Alex to pay. He's gonna have to make false insurance claims payable to non-existent clinics, and that is how Hesh and Tony will get their money. Or Alex can choose to take a dive off this bridge. This innovative move illustrates Tony's brilliance as a quote-unquote businessman. The second installment of season 1 features a skirmish between Tony and Junior, as two men from Tony's crew, Chris and his friend Brendan, rob a truck carrying DVD players. The problem is that trucking company is paying Junior protection money, and he can't let this aggression go unanswered. The acting boss of the DiMeo crime family, Jackie, sits down with both parties and they agree that restitution in the amount of $15,000 should be made. Chris isn't happy about that, but his feelings are irrelevant, and he gives his uncle the money, knowing full well that Tony's gonna pocket close to 5k after negotiating the fee down with his uncle Junior. A bit more on Jackie here, he's only the acting boss because their former leader Eckley DeMeo received a life sentence three years earlier, but Jackie isn't sure his reign is gonna last too long as he's undergoing chemotherapy following his cancer diagnosis. During this meeting with the Sopranos, he makes a remark about naming his successor. So yeah, it's not looking too good for Jackie. Moving on, Junior is right about Chris and Brendan, especially about Brendan, who Tony isn't too fond of either, as he's a meth addict. Chris is more level-headed, which is why he refuses to rob a shipment of Italian suits later on in the episode. He doesn't want to repeat their mistakes. That doesn't stop Brendan and he does the job with two amateurs, one of which hilariously drops his gun, which goes off and the ricochet kills the truck driver. Tony is furious and he wants these two knuckleheads, Chris and Brendan, to return the shipment to Junior, though Tony's men help themselves to a few suits beforehand. Elsewhere, Pussy and Polly receive instructions to locate AJ's teacher's stolen car, and they do so but the vehicle has already been stripped for parts. Not to worry though, they get the plates and find a car of the same model. They paint this new car and put the plates on there, which is why the teacher is confused when he spots his car. The interior is different and it's got a different paint. AJ proclaims that his father is a hero for recovering the car, oblivious to what actually happened. Meanwhile, Livia is up to no good. First, she forgets she is cooking and starts a small fire. This prompts Tony and Carmela to hire a nurse to assist her, but Livia drives her insane with racism and accusations of theft. 
And later on, when Livia is dropping off a friend at her house, she forgets to put the car in reverse and crashes into her. So yeah, it's not tenable for her to live alone. And despite her objections, she's placed in the Green Grove retirement home. Dr. Melfi tries to get to the bottom of this toxic mother-son relationship, but Tony keeps arguing that he is the guilty party here, because this is not how you should treat your mother. The doctor gets him to admit that neither he nor his sisters had a happy childhood, and that's why his siblings moved away as soon as they grew up. And even though Tony knows in his heart that the doctor is right, he can't admit that to himself, and he blames the doctor for trying to turn him against his own mother. Tony's anger toward his mother manifests itself at the Bada Bing, a strip club owned by Silvio. Here, the bartender Georgie struggles to operate the telephone system just like Livia, and after this happens over and over again, Tony has enough and he attacks Georgie, beating him with the phone. Tony's ill-advised effort to repress his feelings about his mother is the cause of this ugly outburst. In episode 3, Silvio's friend Shlomo comes to Tony for help. Shlomo is a hotel owner and has got a problem with his son-in-law Ariel, who won't consent to Shlomo's daughter's divorce request unless he gets a 50% stake in the family's hotel business. He claims that he had a hand in building up the business, so that's what he sees as fair compensation. Tony agrees to quote-unquote convince Ariel, and upon the completion of the job, Tony's crew will receive a 25% stake in the hotel business. Hesh had warned Tony about the difficulty of dealing with Hasidic Jews, as they are very devout and set in their ways, but Tony ignores Hesh's warnings. After all, how hard can it be to convince Ariel? Well, as it turns out, it can be very difficult. Silvio and Polly give him a beating, but that's not enough. They call Tony in to deal with this situation, and Ariel is actually okay with the threats of death, because he believes that his death would put a curse on Shlomo's family, as well as his killers. Tony seeks Hesh's advice after apologizing to him, and he suggests threatening Ariel with castration instead of death, which unsurprisingly gets the job done. Ariel might be willing to die, but he doesn't want to live without his ding-dong. Here's the kicker though, Shlomo goes behind the Italian's back and strikes a deal with Ariel for a 15% stake in the business. Shlomo tries to pay Tony in cash, breaking his promise on the original deal, and Tony doesn't let that slide, telling Shlomo what's what, and forcing him to honor the initial agreement, which gives the Italians a 25% stake. The old geezer even has the goal to call Tony a golem, a Frankenstein, claiming that Tony is a monster for what he's doing to them, even though all he's doing is enforcing a deal they both agreed to. Characterizing Tony as a golem is fair in general, but it's a bit of a stretch in this particular situation. At the same time, Jackie's condition continues to get worse, as his men visit him at the hospital multiple times throughout the episode. Tony revitalizes Jackie with a dancer from the Bada Bing, but that rush of energy is only temporary for the acting boss. Meanwhile, Artie is stressed following the explosion at the restaurant. The insurance investigation is still ongoing with a suspicion of arson, and Tony tries to distract his friends by giving him and his wife Charmaine the job to cater a charity event at the Soprano household. This certainly boosts Artie and Tony's morale. They even have a jovial food fight at the event, but the same thing can't be said for their wives. Carmela uses the same hand gesture when calling Charmaine as she did when calling her servant, which angers Charmaine quite a bit. Because of this, the next day Charmaine tells Carmela that she and Tony got it on back in the day when he and Carmela weren't a couple. Charmaine also adds that she couldn't be happier with the choice she made by marrying Artie, so basically she responds to Carmela's smug acts of superiority by saying that she could have had Tony if she wanted. Meadow and her friend Hunter are up to no good either. They procure some speed from Chris to re-energize, as their SATs and choir recital are on the same day. At first, Chris has a no way Jose attitude. His uncle would kill him if he ever found out. But his girlfriend Adriana makes a good point by saying that it's better for them to get this clean product rather than going to the sketch part of town and getting in all sorts of trouble there. The drug turns out to be helpful for both girls' performances. Earlier in this episode, Chris and Brendan returned a truck full of Italian suits to Junior, but he wasn't satisfied. He asked his soldier, Mikey, for his opinion, and Mikey said that they needed to send a much firmer message. 
Livia shared a similar sentiment when talking to Junior. She suggested scaring Chris because he's a good kid and doing whatever they like with Brendan because she doesn't know him. As a result of these discussions, Mikey hires two Russians who rough up Chris and scare him with a mock execution. And Chris thinks that Tony organized this after finding out about the drug he gave to Meadow. Simultaneously, Mikey executes Brendan in his bathtub as Junior watches on. Now that is how you send a message. War is brewing in episode 4 between Junior and Tony's crews following the execution of Brendan and the mock hit on Chris, who leaves the hospital with a neck brace after receiving some aid. Chris is still paranoid about his uncle Tony, thinking that he ordered the hit because he found out about the drugs given to Meadow, and the young gun is completely rattled when he finds his best friend's body in his bathtub. He tracks down Meadow to ask her if she told her father about the drugs. She swears she didn't and that's when he puts two and two together, speculating that Junior and Mikey were behind this ordeal. Chris would like to take Mikey down but Tony orders him not to as Mikey is a made man and Chris is not. Nonetheless, Tony teaches Mikey an important lesson outside a restaurant by beating him up and stapling his chest. And inside the restaurant is Junior, who isn't in the mood to discuss these events with his nephew. He even tells Tony the next time he shows up, he better comes in heavy, that is with a gun. To make matters worse, Jackie, the acting boss of the DeMeo family, finally passes away and it's not clear who's gonna take his place at the top. The other capos in the family think it should be Tony. They're willing to back him against Junior, but Tony knows that his uncle won't go down without a fight, and a war is never good for business. This is where his therapy sessions with Dr. Melfi comes in handy. The doctor recommends a book to Tony when talking about his mother, in which the author lays out how to keep elderly people happy by giving them the illusion of control. And we can see Tony reading the book later on. Tony applies the aforementioned strategy to his current predicament by throwing his weight behind his uncle and making him the boss of the DeMeo family. That way, Junior has the illusion of control while Tony is the one who's really in charge as he controls the other capos that report to the boss. And those capos are Larry, Ray, and Jimmy. Another benefit of this plan is the fact that Junior would be the face of the family, so naturally he would be the main target of law enforcement. I should also mention that in exchange for his support, Tony asks for and does get some of Junior's most profitable businesses, so all in all a brilliant move by Tony on all fronts. This development is significant for one other reason, and that's the fact that it motivates Tony to remain in therapy. He was getting a bit frightened because Sylvie almost spotted him at the hospital after getting some dental work done, and he was leaving just as Tony was going in for his session. There's also the fact that Tony was starting to have feelings for Dr. Melfi. He even had Vin, a corrupt police detective who owes Tony money from gambling, follow the doctor. And Vin mistook Dr. Melfi for Tony's mistress, which is why he assaulted and arrested the doctor's date. These unhealthy feelings added to Tony's doubts about therapy, but Carmela, thinking that Tony is seeing a male psychiatrist, urged him to continue. Otherwise, their marriage would be in trouble. And in the end, Tony chooses to stick with it for now. Lastly, AJ has an ongoing feud with a much stronger classmate, Jeremy. But surprisingly, Jeremy backs out of a formal fight and he even pays for the shirt that he tore in one of their previous scuffles. AJ can't quite figure out why until he has a chat with his sister, who tells him that it's because he's a mobster's son. Jeremy was afraid of Tony, not AJ. Meadow is obviously right. Jeremy's father George ran into Tony at a plant nursery and coincidentally, Tony was holding an axe while talking to George. He got scared and ran away, so he must have told Jeremy not to mess with AJ ever again. Even though AJ doesn't want to believe Meadow, she shows him a mafia website so he can do his own research. And later on at Jackie's funeral, both siblings spot the federal agents taking photos, kicking off AJ's rude awakening. No man can wear one face to himself and another to the multitude without finally getting bewildered as to which may be true. That quote by Nathaniel Hawthorne hangs on the halls of Bowdoin College in Maine, where Meadow is visiting three colleges with her father. The quote resonates with Tony as he wonders if he is the caring father or the ruthless mobster, 
which face is fake and which one is actually his own. He doesn't know and that identity crisis is one of the reasons why he is depressed. The need to hide things and deceive people is taking its toll on him. We have to rewind to delve deeper into this issue. After they visit Bates College, they head to Colby and on the way there, Meadow asks Tony if he's in the Mafia. She knows he is, she's just testing her father to see if he'll be honest with her. Tony instinctively denies this claim but he eventually admits that some of his income comes from illegal gambling and other activities. Meadow is happy with his father's honesty so she returns the favor by confessing to taking speed when studying for her SATs. Tony is understandably upset and wants to know where Meadow got the drugs from but she doesn't yield. Anyway, they're both delighted to have such an honest relationship. This road trip gets interesting at a gas station where Tony spots a former member of the DeMeo family who became a snitch for the feds and went into the witness protection program. His name is Fabian and these days he goes by Fred. Tony learns about that after communicating with Chris through payphones, which is a common practice among criminals as their own phones might be tapped. To make sure that Fred is indeed Fabian, Tony leaves Meadow at a bar that night with a bunch of college students and he's able to locate Fred's house and office. At the house, Fred gets suspicious thinking that somebody is watching him. So in return, he starts looking for Tony, though he doesn't actually know yet that it's Tony he's looking for. Tony checks out Fred's office and confirms that he is indeed Fabian as he still has a bus hobby, something he picked up in prison, while Fabian scouts the local motels after asking some business owners if anybody was asking around about him. At one of the motels, he takes a peek at the cleaning lady's guest list and spots the Soprano name. And when the Sopranos come back to the hotel, Fabian is ready to kill Tony and Meadow. However, an elderly couple prevents Fabian from going ahead with the execution. He doesn't want any witnesses so he'll take care of Tony the next day. Unfortunately for him, the two crackheads he tries to hire to get the job done get spooked and leave. That's when Tony shows up and puts an end to Fabian's misery by garroting him. They don't see snitches get stitches for no reason. Ratting out your family is seen as such a despicable thing that Tony feels the need to get rid of Fabian himself even though he's on a road trip with his daughter. Soon afterward, Meadow asks her father about the dirt on his shoes and the cut on his hand and Tony can't respond honestly, which discourages Meadow as she realizes that they don't have an honest relationship after all. Tony is wearing one face to himself and another to the multitude and the longer that goes on, the harder it'll become to manage his relationships. Meanwhile, it's stormy in New Jersey where Carmela has the flu and AJ is sleeping over at a friend's house. That's when Father Phil pays a surprise visit to the Soprano household. Phil regularly visits them and hangs out with Carmela. Their relationship is platonic but their unusual intimacy clues you in about where Carmela and Tony stand. Phil and Carmela wine and dine. It's definitely awkward but nothing too weird. Then Dr. Melfi calls the house to tell Tony that they'll have to reschedule tomorrow's appointment because the doctor is sick. Before this phone call, Carmela thought Tony's therapist was a man and with Tony's past shenanigans in mind, Carmela believes there can only be one reason why Tony lied to her about Melfi's gender. She voices all of her frustrations and fears to Father Phil. They have an official confession session and she takes communion. This bizarre religious romantic experience almost turns sexual but the father's body doesn't let that happen as he runs away to the bathroom to puke. He's had too much to drink. Still, he spends the night there and leaves in the morning. Carmela mentions this to Tony when he gets back, adding that nothing happened, though Tony is obviously furious. Carmela turns this around by telling Tony that Dr. Melfi called and she walks away as Tony has to once again justify his lies. This constant deception isn't healthy for a couple and the Hawthorne quote rings true yet again. New Boss, New Arrangements is the name of the game in episode 6 as the first Soprano reign in the DeMeo family officially begins. Junior was put in this position by Tony because he'd be easy to control, but on the contrary, the old geezer rules with an iron fist. His right hand man Mikey smashes up a card game put together by Sammy even though he asserts that it is sanctioned by one of their own capos Jimmy. Later on, Junior's tailor tells the new boss about how his 14-year-old grandson offed himself by jumping off a bridge. The tailor blames Rusty Irish for this as he sold drugs to the grandson. 
Junior, through Mikey, punishes Rusty Irish by condemning him to the same fate as the grandson, and Rusty Irish takes a dive off the same bridge and passes away. And the problem is, Rusty Irish was one of Larry's top earners, and Larry is one of the capos under Junior. As if that wasn't enough, Junior decides to apply back taxes worth $500,000 to Tony's associate Hesh, who back in the day made an arrangement with Tony's father that made him exempt. But that doesn't mean a thing to Junior and he wants all the money Hesh owes to the family. Hesh feels like he's too old to deal with this, so if Tony can't find a way to solve this issue, Hesh thinks he might leave the area. And that's why Tony gets in touch with his childhood friend Johnny, He's the underboss of the Lupertasi crime family, which is one of the big five families in New York, and they have good relationships with the DeMeo family from Jersey. Tony wants it to look like Hesh went directly to Johnny and asked him to be an intermediary in this matter, so this way Tony will look impartial to his uncle. When the two parties meet, they manage to come to an agreement on the figure, as they negotiate it down to 250k. This incident once again demonstrates the capabilities of Tony Soprano's bright mind, and he doesn't stop there because the other capos, especially Jimmy and Larry, are frustrated with Junior's management style, complaining that he eats alone. Tony meets with his uncle at a Little League baseball game and he approaches the subject by bringing up Roman leaders, specifically how Augustus Caesar brought prosperity back to Rome by being a fair and steady leader. Junior is not too amused, but he gets his nephew's point. He decides to divide the bank taxes he received from Hesh to give it to his capos. And Tony, being the good friend he is, returns his own share back to Hesh. At the end of the episode, there's a formal gathering of the Demare family and the FBI is in attendance as well, with agents disguised as waiters. They take photos at the event using their budding cameras, and Junior moves to the top of the FBI's board while Tony remains where he is, level with all the other capos. In his personal life, Tony is having trouble with his drive, getting it up if you know what I mean, which puts him in hot water with his wife Carmela and his mistress Irina. That's because all Tony can think about is Dr. Melfi. He eventually decides to profess his love to her. He even kisses her at some point. Dr. Melfi thinks it's normal for him to feel this way, but she argues it's not love he's feeling. He's simply grateful to her for her help, because the therapy is working. Tony is disappointed as his feelings aren't reciprocated, and at the same time Carmela is growing jealous of Dr. Melfi. She wants to be the woman in his life helping him, and Tony concurs, or shall we say pretends to concur. The seventh episode of season one is relatively uneventful, but it does shed light on Tony's relationship with his mother, and she learns something about Tony that might become a crucial plot point in the future. This mother and son subject comes up in one of Tony's sessions with Dr. Melfi following AJ's shenanigans at school, where he and his friends steal sacramental wine and drink it before showing up drunk to the gym class. Not only does AJ receive a three-day suspension, but also his mental state is examined by the school psychiatrist, who determines after conducting some tests that AJ has borderline ADD, attention deficit disorder. Crucially, AJ is just below the threshold for a full-on ADD diagnosis, and Tony, referring to this result, proclaims that AJ is just a normal 13-year-old who got up to some mischievous stuff, and he'll be grounded accordingly. But he doesn't want AJ to be treated like someone with a mental illness. Carmela agrees with her husband's opinion. In between all of this, the Sopranos have a family dinner with Junior and Livia in attendance, and here they talk about Tony's transgressions as a kid, which includes stealing a car at 10 and stealing lobsters off of boats and selling them on Bloomfield Avenue. As usual, Tony gets defensive because he doesn't like these subjects being brought up when his kids are around, as he doesn't want that behavior to influence AJ or Meadow. AJ's smartass remarks gets him a verdict. He'll be grounded for the next three weeks without skateboarding, watching TV, or playing video games, and he'll have to visit his grandma at the retirement home. During one of these visits, AJ mentions the fact that his father goes to therapy, having recently overheard Tony talking to Carmela about seeing a psychiatrist. Livia is an insanely bad mother and a terrible person, so of course she alludes to this information when Junior visits her later on. But before she can expand on it, Tony walks in. If Junior ever found out that one of his capos was seeing a shrink, that capo would be toast. 
Talking of the shrink, as I've already said, Tony talks about his mother in one of his sessions and his memories are shown to us in flashbacks. These events take place in 1967 and they portray Olivia in a very bad light. She is absolutely ruthless. For example, when Tony's father Johnny brings up an opportunity to move to Reno and leave this life behind, Olivia is adamant about staying. Johnny says he and the kids will go without her and her response is chilling. They're not going anywhere. I'd rather smother them with a pillow than take them to Nevada. When she says she'd smother them, I actually believe her because in another flashback, Tony is driving her mad. He is complaining about his father taking his sister Janice with him and leaving Tony behind all the time. So Olivia threatens to stick this fork in his eye. Whoa, Nelly. Isn't that a little too much? We also learn where Johnny was taking Janice, as one day Tony hides in Johnny's car's trunk and finds out that he takes her to the amusement park. Tony is jealous, but the thing is, that's just a front for wise guys meeting up to keep a low profile. They bring their kids to the amusement park and they discuss their business. But the cops wisen up, arresting Johnny and the other mobsters at the park. In the present, Tony talks to Dr. Melfi about how proud he was of his father and maybe that's why he's grown to be like him. And now AJ might be idolizing Tony in the same way. He is glad that his son is proud of him, but at the same time, he doesn't want AJ to get into this business. Though he's afraid that AJ might not have a choice. Sure, you might have free will, but your environment largely dictates the range of your possible life choices. All of this existential dread and concerns about the future and frustrations with the past are symptoms of Tony's mental suffering. Larry's daughter's wedding is overshadowed by some terrible news he gets from a source within the FBI, who claims that the authorities are preparing indictments to go after the mob. The poor girl has to watch everybody leave one by one, as they all have to undertake quote-unquote spring cleaning, that is ridding their houses and offices of any incriminating items. Tony's house, for example, is filled to the brim with guns and cash, so they have their work cut out for them as Meadow and AJ watch on. And they hide it all at Green Grove after Carmela convinces Livia to hang out with her while we see pussy burning some documents outside his house and the other guys sweeping the bada bing for bugs. The pressure put on them by the feds is displayed very effectively. The feds, led by Agent Harris, search the Soprano household and obviously they come up empty. Tony's rant to his family about Italian Americans being unfairly targeted by the police is hilarious, as if he's actually innocent. And the kids find it funny too coming from their father. A similar sentiment is shared by Dr. Melfi's ex-husband, Richard, upon surmising that Melfi is a patient from the mob. But Richard doesn't blame the cops, no, he accuses the thousands of mobsters for affecting the reputation and lives of 20 million Italian Americans who are just regular people. He even argues that Melfi should drop the mobster as her client. Elsewhere, Tony mentions to the doctor that he might miss a session or two as he might be going on vacation and Melfi understands what he means because she's been watching the news which mentioned the indictments. And after Tony does indeed miss a session, she reminds him that he'll still have to pay for that session. Tony is irate, scattering bills on the floor and treating Melfi like an escort before storming out of her office. Seeing this side of Tony makes Melfi think that maybe Richard is right, but nonetheless she doesn't drop Tony as a client. Chris, in the meantime, is haunted in his sleep by the first man he killed, Emil, which makes Chris paranoid, leading him to dig up the body with Georgie and relocate it. Chris is also having trouble writing his mafia screenplay. His characters have no arc, just like how he doesn't seem to have an arc in real life. His bitter mental state leads to an outburst at a bakery. He shoots a clerk in the foot for making him wait and for the way he speaks to Chris with no respect. Also, he's disappointed not to be mentioned in the papers, which examine the Fed's focus on the mob. When his name is mentioned in a paper later on, he grabs all the copies he can find. He's that desperate for attention and recognition. All of this prompts Tony to have a chat with his nephew. He wants to understand what Chris feels, but this sort of conversation doesn't come naturally to Chris, who puts up a brave front. Tony might be going to therapy, but that doesn't mean anybody else is ready to discuss their feelings. Last, but certainly not least, Livia does something unforgivable. She discloses to Junior the fact that Tony is seeing a psychiatrist. She actually alluded to this in the previous episode, but now she goes ahead and tells it explicitly. Junior is in disbelief. He asks Livia multiple times if he's getting this right, and Livia confirms that that's the case. 
And funnily enough, she says she doesn't want there to be any repercussions, knowing full well that there will be. I'm not buying this senile roleplay. She's definitely not a blabbering idiot. No, she wants to hurt her son. In Season 1 Episode 9, Junior goes down south, both literally and figuratively, as he takes his girlfriend of more than 15 years, Bobby, to Boca, Florida, where we find out that he pleases her with his mouth. However, he doesn't want Bobby to mention this to anybody, as it's seen as a sign of weakness in his masculine world. Unfortunately though, she's already talked about this with her hairdresser, and obviously such noteworthy gossip material doesn't stop with her. It eventually finds its way to Carmela, who mentions it to Tony. Junior, already frustrated with Tony after learning about his mental health problems, doesn't appreciate it when Tony brings up the ongoing south of the border. He puts Tony in his place by saying, quote, at least I can deal with my own problems, unlike some I know, end quote, referring to Tony's therapy sessions. This incident leads Junior to consider taking care of Tony, which he discusses with his right-hand man Mikey. Mikey has always been antagonistic toward Tony, so he's certainly in favor of dealing with this quote-unquote mental weakling. As a consequence of the word getting out, Junior breaks up with Bobby and fires her from her job after he mushes a pie in her face. Within the context of this storyline, you may think of pie in a figurative manner, but don't, he throws an actual pie at her. One last note on this, the FBI had eyes on Junior even in Boca, so they're not messing around. They are serious about the new indictments. Moving on, Tony, Silvio and Artie have to deal with their daughter's soccer coach, Dan, because at first he decides to leave the school for another job, and then they find out that he had an inappropriate relationship with one of his students, Ali, who as a result tried to off herself. This puts Tony in a moral bind. Does he report Dan to the authorities and let the justice system take care of him? Or does he take the matters into his own hands, delivering some good old vigilante justice? He finds the answer to that question after having discussions with Dr. Melfi and Artie. The doctor argues he shouldn't have to assume the burden of righting wrongs in society, while his friend explains that he wouldn't be doing it for justice. It would only be for vengeance and thus for his own satisfaction. Even though Tony lashes out at both of them, in the end he decides to turn Dan in to the authorities, and this difficult decision takes its toll on him, as he gets drunk while on Xanax. But at least he feels like he's done the right thing, telling Carmela he didn't hurt nobody. In episode 10, Tony's crew chances upon a once-in-a-lifetime score after sending a message to the Colombians to stay away from Port Newark, as that territory belongs to the Italians. This message is delivered in the form of a dead drug dealer executed by Polly, who alongside Chris and Pussy discover an insane amount of cash in the dealer's apartment in Manhattan. Polly and Tony celebrate this score with their mistresses, while Chris takes Adriana to the theater. It's funny to think that the only man who isn't married, thus the only one who hasn't promised to be loyal to their partner, is the only one actually staying loyal. However, this much loyalty to Adriana and belief in her comes back to bite Chris and here's how that storyline unfolds. They meet a famous gangster rapper who goes by the name of Massive Genius and he has an ulterior motive when inviting them to the party at his mansion. He's looking out for a mother whose deceased son worked with Hesh back when he was in the music business. Chris arranges a meeting between Genius and Hesh and Genius wants Hesh to pay out 400k to the artist's mother or else. The funny thing is, the or else part turns out to be a legal threat, as Genius says he'll sue Hesh for the money. The old man goes, okay, I'll counter sue you because you sampled a backing vocal in your last single and I control the recording rights for that. They agree to see each other in court, which is hilarious because of Genius' reputation as a gangster and because his initial threats seem to signal a violent feud, but no. Tony and Hesh find this depressing. The world is changing so much that even gangsters aren't the same anymore. In the meantime, Genius supports Adriana's desire to become a music producer, and Chris agrees to finance her as he's flush with cash following the crew's recent payday. Adriana organizes a demo for Visiting Day, a band led by her ex-boyfriend Richie. The problem is the band sucks, but Genius goes along with this as he fancies Adriana, leading her to believe that she's doing well and Visiting Day is doing well. Why would Genius support her otherwise? 
The recording session doesn't go too well as Richie is just not that good. The producer thinks so too, and Richie is also a knobhead so he antagonizes Chris who beats up Richie with a guitar. Richie and the band eventually complete the job and Chris asks Hesh for his opinion, who goes quote, a hit is a hit, and this is not a hit, end quote. This alerts Chris to Genius's ulterior motive, the fact that he wants to get in Adriana's pants, and he shares that sentiment with Adriana, but she doesn't take it too well. It goes from bad to worse when he says she's letting emotions cloud her judgment. Even though he's right, there's not been a single woman in the history of mankind that has taken those words the right way and reacted appropriately. So she storms out claiming that he doesn't respect her enough. This is a big hit to Chris's state of mind. Just when he thought he was gonna amount to something on his own and make it big in the music business with Adriana, he has a massive fight with her. Elsewhere, Dr. Bruce Cusamano, who referred Tony to Dr. Melfi following his initial panic attack, receives a box of cigars from Tony as a thank you. In return, he invites Tony to the golf club, and Tony takes him up on that invitation following a barbecue party at Bruce's house. But the day turns into a farce when Bruce and his friends treat Tony like a dancing bear rather than a human. They constantly ask him about the mafia, and he's embarrassed to be reduced to just a mobster. Kinda similar to how he felt when he was likened to a golem earlier in the season. His feelings are further hurt when Bruce says that the country club isn't accepting new members. So Tony gets back at him by giving him a package that contains nothing of value, but he makes Bruce think that the package is very important. Quote, I need you to hang on to this for a while for me. Hang on to it and I'll come get it when I need it. End quote. Bruce and his wife Jean are extremely nervous as they wonder what's in the box and whether or not they should open it, which means that Tony's prank is a success. Talking of the Cusamanos, they host another dinner party in this episode which features Dr. Melfi as a guest. She goes to the bathroom to take a look at Tony's house from afar and she hears him yelling almost like a bear. Her curiosity is a bit weird but nothing more comes of it. Lastly, Carmela overhears Jean at the barbecue party discussing the stock market with her friends, and soon afterward Carmela gets into the stock market as an insurance policy if anything were to happen to Tony and his fortune, and she actually manages to turn a profit. The FBI comes back to the fore as the season 1 finale approaches, raiding Jimmy's pool hole and arresting him after finding a stash of guns under his pool table. Pussy is also there, he tries to slip away but fails. His back gives out during the chase, which is not surprising as a few days ago his back was giving him trouble at a brothel, where Polly and Detective Vin were also present. That is noteworthy as Pussy attracts some unwanted attention from the crew after being released on bail rather quickly, with one of Vin's sources claiming that Pussy is an informant for the FBI, and that's why he was let go so soon. On top of that, Polly chats with Pussy's doctor to find out that there might not be anything wrong with Pussy's back, so he might be ghosting the crew with that excuse to conduct his duties for the FBI. Tony doesn't immediately want to believe this shocking allegation. He wants to see proof. After all, Pussy's not only a longtime member of his crew, but he's also one of Tony's best friends. However, Vin can't get any documents proving his claim. A chat with Dr. Melfi makes Tony think that Pussy's back pain may be caused by stress, perhaps as a result of turning on the crew. Later on, Polly takes Pussy to a bathhouse to make sure that he's wearing a wire, but Pussy refuses to get undressed, insisting that the doctor told him the heat isn't good for his back. So Pussy's behavior during the surprise visit to the bathhouse is certainly suspicious, and Tony's going crazy trying to figure this out, because he learns that Vin owes Pussy 30k in gambling debt, which might be the motive behind Vin's allegation. Tony doesn't know what to believe. The truth comes out as Polly awaits Tony's final instruction on what to do with Pussy, and Jimmy pays a visit to Tony after being released from jail. Jimmy's inquisitiveness and questions lead Tony to conclude that Jimmy is the rat not Pussy. That said, Pussy curiously vanishes and the lads have no idea where he might be gone and why he has disappeared. Elsewhere, the police raid the aforementioned brothel, arresting one of Junior's capos Ray, but more importantly Vin. The already depressed detective can't take being disgraced and losing the only good thing in his life, which is why he offs himself by jumping off a bridge. Afterward, Tony chats to the madam at the brothel, who was sort of like Vin's therapist, 
and Tony discovers that Vin always viewed Tony as a friend, even though Tony was nothing but mean to him. He wonders if he contributed to Vin's demise, and this combined with Pussy's vanishing act is a massive hit to Tony's mental health. Talking of hits, Junior orders one to take Tony out after Olivia tells him that her son has been meeting with the other capos at the retirement home. With everything that's been going on this season, having already learned that Tony is seeing a therapist, the news about the capos meeting behind his back is the last straw for Junior. So he tells Mikey to do what needs to be done and Mikey is over the moon. Tony is utterly miserable as we go into the penultimate episode of season 1. He doesn't want to get out of bed, he refuses to shave and more importantly he doesn't show up to work. His mood is temporarily improved when he spots a gorgeous woman at the Cusamanos garden, Isabella. He chats with her, learning that she's a foreign exchange student from Italy, and Tony decides to take her out to lunch, where he has a daydream featuring Isabella breastfeeding a baby named Antonio. A bit of a weird one and we'll come back to it later in the video. In the meantime, Junior's hit on Tony is in full swing. Mikey gets one of his associates, Tani, to hire two outsiders who won't be tracked back to Junior. These goons are Ray and Claiborne, and their plan is to take Tony out at his regular newsstand. What they don't know is, Tony goes into a shop close by and leaves through the back door to go into Dr. Melfi's office. That's his way of hiding his visits and making sure that he is not tracked. Add to that the fact that Chris was worried about Tony and he blocked the hitman's view while he was following Tony around and the first attempt ends before it starts, because they lose Tony. Donnie meets with Mikey to discuss what went on, Junior overhears a joke about even Tony's mother wanting him dead, and the big boss doesn't appreciate Donnie's loud mouth and orders Mikey to take care of him and shut him down forever, which Mikey does with a disturbing amount of comfort and maybe even joy. This will not affect Ray and Claiborne as they've already been told by Donnie to try again. And they do, but Tony's hazy perception dissipates quickly. His survival instincts kick in as he sees Claiborne coming from the reflection on his car window. But the assassin still has an opportunity to open fire. He does and the bullet finds the orange juice bottle in Tony's hand. He has a chance to get in the car and dodge until Claiborne gets close to him. Once he does, Tony gets him in a headlock and then Ray shows up to get the job done, but instead he shoots his accomplice. Tony reaches out to Ray to hold his gun and he puts the pedal to the floor to drag Ray down the street. Ray eventually falls down and the reinvigorated Mafia Capo loses control as he looks behind. He crashes into a parked car, injuring his leg. The FBI doesn't miss this opportunity to turn Tony. Agent Harris shows up at the hospital to convince Tony to enter into a witness protection program. Tony obviously declines this offer, insisting that he was just a victim of a simple carjacking attempt though he and his confidants suspect that's not the case. Silvio, Polly and Chris believe Junior had something to do with it, and just as they're discussing this matter at Tony's house, Junior and Livia pay them a visit. Understandably, Junior acts like he had nothing to do with this. He says he'll track down whoever is behind it, while Livia looks mentally disoriented as she can't recognize Meadow. Junior presumes she's simply pretending that she doesn't actually have dementia, and this is all an attempt to hide her role in the attempt on Tony's life. Junior says as much to Livia, who acts like she has no idea what Junior is talking about. Livia is an absolutely vile person and an even more sickening mother. You might think she's doing this just because she isn't the center of attention in Tony's life and because he put her in a retirement home. This is simply her taking revenge. But I don't think so. I believe that no matter how Tony treated her, she would have tried to make his life a living hell as she's simply too selfish of a person to empathize with others. We saw glimpses of this same behavior in flashbacks toward her husband Johnny and it's also why her daughters left town as soon as they could. Tony comes to the same realization after finding out that there was no Isabella. His lithium medication was making him hallucinate. And that whole chapter about Isabella breastfeeding a child named Antonio was his dreaming of a loving mother, the ideal mother he never had. After discussing this with Dr. Melfi, Tony stops taking lithium and she suggests that Tony's subconscious constructed this whole Isabella chapter as a result of his repressed resentment toward his actual mother. 
Tony was firmly against this theory throughout the season, but now he's beginning to think that the doctor might be right as he tries to figure out who was behind the attempt on his life. Despite all of this stress and adversity, at least Tony feels truly alive following the attack, maybe for the first time since the show started. The season 1 finale of The Sopranos is a whacking fiesta, starting with the rat Jimmy, who's lured in by Chris and executed by Silvio, on the orders of Junior and Tony. Next up, Tony and his crew have to deal with the big boss and his crew for putting out the hit on Tony. And interestingly, Tony confirms for a fact that his uncle was behind the hit thanks to the FBI. The Fed's plan is to turn Tony against the Mafia and make him a witness, which is why Agent Kubitoso lets him listen to the recordings from the Green Grove retirement home. Yes, the Feds had that place bugged, even though Kubitoso's colleagues thought it would be a waste of time and resources. The tapes confirm to Tony that Junior was planning the hit, and on top of that, it confirms to him that Junior was being provoked by Livia. Prior to this meeting with the FBI, Tony lashed out at Dr. Melfi after she outright said that Livia might have a borderline personality disorder, which might cause her to constantly initiate conflict as she has no love or compassion, even for her own son. And Tony's Isabella hallucination from episode 12 was his subconscious warning him about his mother. As I've already said, Tony didn't like this analysis too much and lashed out at Dr. Melfi, but afterward the tape certainly confirmed what Dr. Melfi was suggesting. The doc was so scared by Tony's rage that she doesn't want to talk to him the next time he shows up, but Tony apologizes to her and advises her to leave town until things cool down because they might come after her too. Later on, Tony comes clean to his crew about his mental struggles, saying that his uncle is using that fact against him, and that's why he tried to have Tony killed. Silvio and Polly are okay with this reveal, but it's a bit too much for Chris to accept, as it goes against their entire macho environment. Nonetheless, they all agree to do their part to exact revenge. Tony and Silvio have already taken care of Chucky, one of Junior's most prominent soldiers who put together the hit with Mikey, who is next in order. Mikey is chased and intercepted by Polly and Chris during his morning run, and both of Tony's men empty their mags to end Mikey's misery. This is significant for Chris for one other reason, and that's the fact that Mikey killed Chris's friend Brendan at the start of the season. The third and final target is obviously Junior, but the feds get to him first, arresting him, Capo Larry, and 13 other mobsters on charges related to a stock fraud scam. That's why Tony and members of his crew aren't taken in. They weren't involved in that. The feds try to convince Junior to turn on the DeMeo family, and in particular Tony. They want Junior to admit that Tony is the de facto boss, but it doesn't look like Junior will budge, which tells us a lot about him. He was willing to have his own nephew killed, but he can't bring himself to rat him out, because snitching is against everything he stands for. Elsewhere, Carmela finally sees Father Phil for who he truly is, a grifter and an emotional and financial freeloader. She calls him out on his behavior and that seems to be that. This weird back and forth between them seems to be done. Though we do see Father Phil elsewhere in this episode, as he advises Artie to turn Tony into the police. You see, Artie has just found out from Livia that Tony burned down his restaurant, and even though Tony swears on his mother that he didn't do it, Artie doesn't believe him, and he asks Father Phil what he should do. A couple of notes here, it's not a surprise that Livia is still wreaking havoc even though she's pretending to have dementia, and she is under care at the nursing home after leaving the place without notifying them. When Artie comes to visit her though, she suddenly remembers that Tony burned down his restaurant, also, it was funny to see Tony swearing on his mother because by this point he'd already learned about her actions, so swearing on her meant nothing. Anyway, Artie decides against turning Tony in because Charmaine is very happy with the new restaurant, Nuovo Vesuvio, which they kickstarted with the insurance money they got from the old place. So turning Tony in would be disastrous for them and Artie doesn't want to put Charmaine through that. Also, Charmaine hires Adriana as a hostess, and Adriana is back together with Chris. They've patched things up. With everything Livia has done, Tony feels like he's had enough. He goes to Greengrove, picks up a pillow, ready to smother her. Unfortunately for him, Livia has just had a stroke, and she's being taken to a hospital. Tony gets very close to his mother, as she's wheeled off, saying to her that he knows what she did. 
this incredibly tragic scene ends with Livia being taken away and Tony shouting in disbelief, enraged, saying, quote, Look at her face, she's smiling. End quote. Luckily, the season doesn't end on that completely sour note. After finding out that Dr. Melfi has taken his advice and left town, Tony and his family take shelter at Nuovo Vesuvio during a thunderstorm. Artie thinks about not letting them in for a second as they're about to close, but he quote-unquote forgives Tony and lets them in. The season ends with a toast from Tony who says, quote, I'd like to propose a toast to my family. Someday soon you're gonna have families of your own. And if you're lucky, you'll remember the little moments like this, that were good, end quote. This is also a bit sad because Tony can't be happy with the overall picture in his life and he has to find joy in the little moments. That is all he can do. Alright, that's a wrap for season 1. Thank you for watching this recap. I hope it was useful and if so, please like the video, subscribe to the channel for more Sopranos content and be sure to leave your comments about the first season down below. Take care and see you in the next video.